Hey, good morning. So I'm, I love sports. I love this time of the year. All the four major sports are, are, are in activity. And uh, I, I love the way in which either athletes give themselves or other athletes give uh, athletes uh, nicknames. Um, if you're from the Southwest Florida area, you may or may not know that uh, probably our greatest NFL football player who came from this area, uh, Dion Sanders, uh, gave himself the nickname Primetime, Primetime. Uh, or if you're a little bit older like myself, you'll maybe remember from the Chicago Bears, a 300 plus pound uh, uh, defensive tackle, William the Refrigerator Perry. You remember that name? Um, there's Magic Johnson, the great uh, uh, guard from the Lakers. There's uh, Air Jordan, Michael Air Jordan, uh, probably my favorite uh, because he's a, he was a, a pastor. Uh, the Minister of Defense, Reggie White from the Green Bay, Green Bay Packers. Um, all great, great, great names around here. We have some names, uh, nicknames that we give to the different pastors. Uh, pastor Wes... <laughs> Oh, we call him Thumper because his right leg, when he starts to get really excited, he's, he's like little Thumper in the Disney. Um, Taylor Foley and Taylor Brown, we can't keep them straight, so we call Taylor Brown TB. It's just a kind of a way, TB, uh, TFO, TB, uh, for their different names. Uh, Casey, Pastor Casey Page, um, she's called the Case, and if you know her, she's a Case, right? She's a Case. Um, so uh, my nickname when I was growing up was Ace, 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 Ace Avito, but it was because my dad was in the United States Air Force and he flew planes, so they called me the Ace. Well, um, the greatest nickname that I've ever heard, the greatest of all times nickname that I ever heard was, um, was a nickname that a guy gave himself. It's found in the pages of the Bible. And we've been looking at some of the things that he wrote uh, he was John, the youngest of the disciples, and John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, that's a great nickname. Now, um, it wouldn't make it on a t-shirt, maybe. I think it would be a really cool tattoo, though, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and, and uh, he gave it to himself when he was writing himself into the story, the biography of Jesus. John wrote uh, five of the New Testament uh, books or letters, uh, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Now, the first time we read that he gave himself this moniker was uh, in this section of Scripture we've been looking at. It's called the Upper Room Discourse uh, from John 13 to John 17. It's the longest section of Jesus' teaching in the New Testament. And it begins with Jesus taking the disciples into the upper room where he washes their feet, kind of unheard of. And then uh, they sit at the table. We know that what happens next, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us this, they had the Lord's Supper. John leaves that part out. But in John 13, verse 23, it says this, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Now, um, if you've ever seen Michelangelo's picture of the Last Supper, he shows John uh, sitting next to Jesus with his head uh, on the chest of Jesus. And um, one of my mentors by book, Brendan Manning, um, it's interesting, today is a holiday, it's Halloween, tomorrow's a holy day, it's called All Saints Day, where we remember the saints who've gone on in front of us, and Brennan has gone on in front of us. And Brennan was a messy Christian. Uh, he, he, he walked with a limp. He was a Roman Catholic priest who decided to get married. That didn't go over well. <laughs> but he struggled with alcoholism, even as a priest. And he wrote about life in Jesus and how messy our spirituality is. But he also understood the remarkable, reckless fury that is the love of God, as Rich Mullins said. And he wrote in one of his books uh, about Abba's child. And, and, and in it, he, he, he describes how that night in the upper room when John had his chest, or his head on the chest of Jesus, that it was then that he heard um, God's love for him through the chest cavity of Jesus. Isn't that powerful? And then listen to what he writes in his book, Abba's Child. He said, living in the awareness of our belovedness 
is the axis around which the Christian life revolves. Being the beloved is our identity, the core of our existence. It's not merely a lofty thought, an inspiring idea, or one name among many. It is the name, listen to this, it is the name by which God knows us and the way he relates to us. You see, this the disciple whom Jesus loved was not just for John, it's for you too. It's for first century followers like John and 21st century followers like you and me in this room and, and online. It's, it's this theme of love that we're going to look at today for a few minutes because John seemed to be captivated by this idea of love. He wrote about it in, in all five of his books that he wrote that are in the New Testament. And we're going to go back to the text that we've been looking at for a number of weeks. And let me just kind of remind you of the context. Jesus is in the upper room. And as soon as he finishes these words in John 17, it says that Jesus goes out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he prays. And remember, he asks his father, can this cup, can this cross go by? Do I have to do this? And his father tells him he does. Jesus gets up and the disciples join him. They make their way a little closer uh, to Jerusalem, to the city walls. And, and there Jesus is betrayed with a kiss by Judas, one of his own. And then just a few moments later, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. And the ten abandon Jesus, utterly alone. And Jesus is stripped, stripped naked, beaten, cursed at, spit. He's beaten with a cat of nine tails beyond recognition. He carries the cross through the city streets of Jerusalem while the very people who praised him just a week before now cursing a week later. He makes his way to a garbage heap outside of Jerusalem where Jesus hangs between heaven and earth to redeem all of creation. And it is right before all of this that happens that Jesus speaks what I'm calling his last will and testament. And so we're going to look at the text we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks. I've invited Jen to come and help me uh, this, this morning, uh, Jen Strode, our director of worship. And so Jen is going to read, to us, uh, read for us from John chapter 15. Here you go, Jen, right there. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. It's on the screen. Uh, let's listen as Jen reads. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the world that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit itself by, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jen. So listen. When I was in seminary, I took a class called English Bible. And in this English Bible class, one of the things they said we should do when we read Scripture, uh, and remember, we read Scripture so Scripture can read us. Amen? And, amen? Amen? <laughs> okay. So uh, we read Scripture so Scripture can read us. And, and, and my professor taught us um, to look for repeating words. Now, I'm not going to read it again, but look at the screen here, and you can see two words that I've put in, in highlighted colors, and they're words that Jesus, in these seven verses, repeats again and again, two words. It's the word fruit, you see that in red, and the word abide, you see that in blue. And what's Jesus' point in all of this? Why, why, why does Jesus do this? And here's what Jesus wants us to get. He wants us to understand that we need to remain in him. It isn't just about beginning a relationship with Jesus. We need to remain in him, begin and remain in him. And if we do that, Jesus says that our lives will bear much fruit. And then Jesus tells the inverse of that. And here's what he says. He says, if you don't remain in me, you will bear no fruit. Nothing, he says. And it makes perfect sense. You cut a branch off of a vine, the branch dies. 
There's no fruit possibility. What Jesus wants us to know in these first seven verses, it's what we've been trying to teach, Pastor Wes, Pastor Taylor, and myself, over the last three weeks is this. This abiding stuff is important. Jesus doesn't say, just come follow me. He says, abide in me. Remain in me. Stay in me. My 94-year-old mom gets this. She watches every week from Orlando, Florida. She says, Pastor Wes is her favorite preacher. I can't get it. But that's okay. That's all right. I'll get over it in a little bit. No, my mama loves me. I'm her favorite preacher. That's right, mama. Um, And that's okay. But she sent me this text on Monday morning after I got done preaching. It's here on the screen. Look at it. It said, good morning, son. Read this and thought I'd share. Love this. Mama's a theologian. Abide isn't a motel stay. It's a mortgage. (laughs) You pay 89 bucks to stay at the Holiday Inn and then you leave. And a lot of us treat our relationship with God that way. We come in, we join in online, watch for an hour, we enjoy it, drop a few bucks in the plate, and that's our relationship with God. Is that all there is? (laughs) Or is it a mortgage? You know what a mortgage is, right? (laughs) You got to go out and you got to borrow a bunch of money, and then you got to go to work the next day. (laughs) You got to work at it. Remember, grace isn't opposed to effort, it's opposed to earning. Jesus says, come follow me, but Jesus also says, come abide in me. And see, what we're talking about, what Jesus is talking about here, when he uses all this image, Pastor Taylor helped us last week, of this cutting off and throwing into the branches. It's not talking about going to heaven or hell here. This is not what this text is talking about. It's talking about the here and now, not the there and the there. It's talking about right now, we can cultivate an intimate, we can abide in Jesus in such a way that we know that we are the beloved of God. Pastor Wes and I have this saying, whenever somebody comes in to see us and they leave, one of us will ask, well, how'd it go? And Pastor Wes or I will always say, it always comes back to Cogpal. Do they know that they are a beloved child of God, person of worth? That's what it all comes back to. Jesus wants us to know that we can abide in confidence in him. And that it's not about our IQ, how much money we got in our IRA account. It's not about our pedigree. It's not about the square footage of our home. It's not about even our good looks. It's about the Father saying to you and me, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And we live in a world that wants to squeeze that out of you and me. So we have to learn to abide. That's what this abiding stuff is about. But Jesus doesn't end it there. He doesn't end it there. We're going to look at just 10 more verses. I'm going to ask Jen to come up here and read for me one more time. I'm making this girl work on her last day here at Grace Church. Come on. I'm going to make her work. Come on, sister. Read for us from John 15, verses 8 through 17. These are the next 10 verses that Jesus speaks. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. All right. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jen. Now listen, my uh, seminary professor would be proud of us today because I want us to once more look at all 10 verses just on one slide and notice one word, look up at the screen, it's the word what? It's the word love. You see it repeated again and again in these verses. The word love or the word loved is found in in these verses, these 10 verses, nine times. 
So could it be that Jesus is saying this to us? Remain in me. Stay with me. Abide with me. Take out a mortgage, not a hotel stay. Abide with me and you will bear fruit and that fruit will be the fruit of love. But we use the word love for all kinds of stuff. What, what does it mean? Well, in the Greek language, in the New Testament, there are, there are four words that are found to describe love. Uh, there's eros love. It's, it's romantic love. It's the love that a man has for a woman uh, as they commit themselves in marriage. Then there's storge love. It's love within a family. Yesterday, we celebrated my father-in-law's 87th birthday at home. It was lots of storge love there. Love within a family. And then there's deep friendship love, phila, philia love, philia delphia, the, the city of brotherly love. It's this love that we have in deep friendships with one another. But the word that Jesus uses here is the word agape love. It's the unconditional love that God has for you and for me. It's the bestowed love that God gives to you and to me when he says, this is my beloved daughter. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well, well pleased. It's the unconditional love, no strings attached love that God has for you and for me. And here's the deal. God says, I want to pour this kind of love into you as you abide in me, that you will bear fruit and it indeed will be the fruit like a conduit of the love of God, this unconditional love that we would abide in him so that we might bear much fruit and that fruit is the fruit of love. I tried to uh, gather what Jesus was saying in all of these verses into just a, a little prayer. And here's the prayer that I think uh, that Jesus is praying over us. He's saying, abide in me deeply and intimately. And you will know the Father's love to the core of who you are. And then out of the overflow of my love for you, you'll be able to love others with my unconditional love. Now, um, I, I think of it as living sacramentally. Um, I learned in seminary the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, that the sacraments are an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. It's outward and visible. So in baptism, it's the water. In communion, it's the bread and the juice. They're outward and visible signs of an inward and spiritual grace. And so what it means for us to live sacramentally is for us to outwardly and visibly show the love, the unconditional love of Jesus to a broken world that becomes a reflection of an inward and spiritual grace, God's unconditional love for us. And friends, it's the only reason that the church exists. The church is the gathered people of God. It's the only reason that we exist. So our church is partnering uh, with an organization here in town um, to do these job fairs because we believe that felons are beloved. We believe that people who've broken the law and are felons are beloved children of God. And let me tell you why this job fair matters so much to me. Because the little boy that I raised at Grace Church is a felon. My sweet Nathan who has struggled with addictions, and in the worst of his addictions, it led him to do stupid things that broke the law. And he carries the badge felon. And my sweet boy struggles to get a job. Even though he's been sober for four years, he struggles to get a job. And, and Christians of all people ought to believe in the audacity of grace. Amen. That no matter what you've done, there's a God who loves you most and who loves you best. And no matter what the world labels you, God labels you as beloved. That's why we do what we do. 
That's why we offer Christmas. It's getting ready to be Christmas. That's why we do Oma's Heart. That's why we do Angel Tree. Because we don't care what the world labels you. We will label you the beloved of God. That's what it means to abide in Jesus and bear much fruit. The fruit of love. That's living sacramentally. But there's one thing I want us to look at. Uh, as we kind of pull things to a close. And it's, it's, it's just one verse. We went past it quickly. Jen read it a few moments ago. John 15, uh, verse 11. Let's read this together. Ready? Go. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Okay, I'm going to be seminary prof. What word is in there twice? It's the word? Joy. The word? Joy. The word joy. The word joy. See, here's the beautiful thing of Jesus. He says, if you abide in me, You will abide in me and your life will be filled with joy. The joy isn't happiness. Happiness is about circumstances. Joy is about a relationship with God. C.S. Lewis said, joy is the serious business of heaven. I love that. But the best quote I've ever heard is Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday put it this way. He says, if you have no joy, there's a leak in your Christianity somewhere. (laughs) Some of us are leaking pretty bad. That's right. You see... This abiding, this this gift of fruit-bearing love, unconditional love, and spilling it out into the world is a joyful, joyful task. So let's kind of wrap it all up. What does all this mean? Put simply, it means abiders choose love. Say that with me. Abiders choose love. Say it again. Abiders choose love. So I looked up the word abiders, and it's, it's a word that's not used much. And the word abiders means a person who is a dweller. This is a person who takes out a mortgage, right? And, and abiders choose love. When I looked at the dictionary, it had these two words next to it, rare and archaic. Because it's not a word you use much. Most of us don't go to work tomorrow. How you doing? Are you an abider today? Probably not. But what if we can make abiders cool again? What if we could be the people who make abiding in Jesus cool again? You see, because our world is begging for a group of women and men who will live sacramentally who will live by the very way in which they love the world as outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace. Men and women who've been ravished like John by Jesus and his love. For you are the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now when our teaching team got to this point in our message preparation, it is intense fellowship broke out, all right? Like we were, we were disagreeing about some stuff. Because the question came, I raised the issue and said, well, you know, um, I mean, if you abide in Jesus, it's just going to naturally flow out of you. See, I grew up in Orlando, Florida, when there were lots of orange groves. This is before Disney was there. When there were lots of orange groves. And you never went past an orange grove and listened to the orange trees going, oranges, I got to make oranges. Orange trees grow oranges naturally. So I said, love should come naturally. And then one in our group, one in our group said, yeah, George, I was sexually molested when I was a child. How do I naturally love that person? And so we wrestled with it. Does this stuff just naturally, organically just come out of us when we abide in Jesus or do we have to choose it? And we agreed as a teaching team at all of the campuses of Grace Church that the answer is yes. It's both and, of course. You see, let's get real practical for just a second. All of us have in our lives what we call VIPs, very important people, right? People that are fairly easy to love. I have four grandkids you ain't got to pay me to love. I'll pay you to let me love them, all right? I love my four grandbabies, very easy to love, VIPs. That comes naturally. EGRs, on the other hand, extra grace required people. Now, come on now. They might... (laughs) They might be sitting next to you, but how many of us have an extra grace required person, at least one in our life? Lift your hands. Don't be, this is, this is like church, confession time. Okay. We all have EGR people in our lives, yeah. 
Extra grace required people. They, are, they, 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 they require more grace. They require a power greater than ourself to choose to love. And so it was 10 years ago uh, that um, a man walked into an Amish schoolhouse in Lancaster, Pennsylvania area and murdered 10 Amish girls, schoolgirls. The man's name was Charles Roberts. He gunned them down. Listen to how one reporter put it of what happened in this Christian community in Pennsylvania. In the midst of their grief over this shocking loss, the Amish, the Amish community didn't cast blame. They didn't point fingers. They didn't hold a press conference with attorneys at their side. Instead, they reached out with grace and compassion towards the killer's family. The afternoon of the shooting, an Amish grandfather of one of the girls who was killed expressed forgiveness towards the killer, Charles Robert. That same day, Amish neighbors visited the Roberts family to comfort them in their sorrow and pain. And later that week, the Roberts family was invited to the funeral of one of the Amish girls who had been killed. And Amish mourners, get this, outnumbered non-Amish at the murderer Charles Roberts' funeral. You see, these abiding followers of Jesus, who we sometimes consider to be a bit awkward, a bit different, these abiding followers of Jesus had lived in their discipleship with Jesus, that when the rubber met the road, when it was at, that, at the right hour, they could choose extravagant love and forgiveness. Friends, it is possible to live sacramentally. It is possible. It is possible for us to love the VIPs in our world and in our life naturally and to choose to love the EGRs in our life by the grace of God. It is possible. And so John is an old man now. John, the one who was the disciple whom Jesus loved, he sits down, likely on the island of Patmos. They're martyred, or they're sent away, uh, so that while the other disciples who he had walked with with Jesus decades before were all martyred for their faith in Jesus. He's the only one to live. He's an old man, and he pens some words. He remembers back to those three marvelous years of walking with Jesus, the things that he saw with his own eyes, that he heard with his own ears. He remembers those things. He, he remembers when, when Jesus was murdered on the cross, and he remembers three days later when Jesus rose from the dead and when he appeared to them in that room and he spoke those words, peace be with you. He remembers when Jesus ascended into heaven and when the Holy Spirit came in power. And he remembered when Peter stood and preached and 3,000 people gave their life to Jesus. He remembers when a killer of the church named Saul became Paul, a pillar of the church, and spread the movement of Jesus all around the known world. He remembered all of that and more. And he sat down with parchment and pen. And he wrote a word to weary Christ followers. And I want to read it to you this morning. But I want to invite you first to close your eyes and to take a deep breath. And listen to the words from the disciple whom Jesus loved. Beloved let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. 
if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. So with your eyes still closed, I don't know if you have a nickname or not, and I, don't, I know that God knows and he knows your name. And today, God wants to give you a, a new title, a new nickname, a gift for you to claim as your own. Because my sister, my brother, you are the disciple whom Jesus loves. Say that in your heart. You are the disciple. Put your name in there. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. And as freely as we have experienced the love of God, On this playing field that we call life, let us freely leave behind a legacy fitting of our name, a legacy of love. Because right here and right now, you are loved. Therefore, therefore, love one another. Let's stand for prayer. And so, Father, we thank you that you bestow upon all of us the title of beloved. Help us to know, God, at the core of who we are, that there's nothing that we could do that would make you love us more. There's nothing that we could do that would make you love us less. And that the same Jesus who said, come and follow me, is the Jesus who says to us, abide in me, bear much fruit, the fruit of love. And so as we sing about your reckless love now, would you pour it into our hearts? Would you give to us a grace that we need so that connected to the vine, we might bear the fruit of love. We pray this prayer in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. All of God's people agreeing said, amen. So we're going to sing Reckless Love. Uh, The altar's open. If you want to come and pray, you're invited to pray. If you need somebody to pray with you, lift a hand or make where you are or online your place of prayer. Let's worship.